Good morning. Real quick, who are the surgeons? Can you raise your hands? How many neuro? Who's neuro? And ortho. All right. And who does a lot of MIS? Who doesn't really? Okay, some new and some old. When you do MIS, what are you doing? Are you doing deformity or mostly degenerative? Mostly degenerative. Both? Mostly degenerative. Anybody else? Yeah. Mostly degenerative? I would say that's the majority of all surgery anyway. Um, and then when you get to uh, the deformity parts of things, you've got different classes of deformity. You've got the second case he saw, which is a real scoliosis. And then you've got the degenerative deformity that we all see in our, in our office and figure out how the best way to treat them are. Um, how do you do this? Okay. For those of you who don't, who don't know me, I'm the director of minimally invasive, motion preserving, robotically, robotically navigated laser spine surgery. That's, that's crap, right? But I put all those keywords, those are the words that you see everybody talking about when you, when you Google, that's everything. We're the best. We do lasers. We do robots. We do this. We do that. Um, someday I'm going to put that on the website and just see if I get away with it. Or, but, um, the reason I put that there is when you, when you talk about these techniques, expandable technology is kind of one of those keywords that, especially from a company standpoint, I remember back before the big companies ever had it, one company, a big company, developed a good expandable T-lift cage, and then all the other companies started to see, oh, this is the real deal, and they started losing cases from it, and it wasn't just a marketing scheme, it wasn't just a scam, it was clinically relevant, and then you started seeing all the other companies like, we need one of those, we need to develop one of those. Um, uh oh, let me get rid of that. Oh. Laser spine astute, right? So everybody, I, most of you guys have probably seen this. This is in the Sky Mall magazine and all the airplanes. This is the real advertisement, right? Where they've got, where's the more? They've got this. You know, their patient is already on an island with the midline incision, a midline bayonet. I have no idea what they did midline. Probably just you know an, an epidural injection. Um, Nice and tan, and this one's like anemic and white, already, you know, <laughs> still institutionalized with this Frankenstein incision there. But, I mean, that's what people see. That's what patients, they don't know what minimally invasive means, but they, they, they like the way it looks. They like the way it sounds. Um, and so they come asking for it. And I'm sure most of you guys have heard, do you guys use laser? I hear it every single day. Do you use lasers? And I say, yeah, actually, I use a laser-guided microscope, even better than theirs. All right. This is me, my, my service, you know, my practice here. So this is, so, all right. So whenever you think about changing what we do, whenever you think about changing the status quo, you have to ask yourself why. Is there, is there any way to improve on what we're doing now? What are the reasons to change? You've seen some of these, right? He just gave a great talk about minimally, minimally invasive surgery in general. But incision size, cosmetic. It's really what happens underneath, right? The muscle detachment, the weakness of the muscles, the adjacent segments where you take down the multifidus and the, um, you denervate and devascularize the joints above that we're not fusing, uh, the blood loss, the infection rates, the you know, in-hospital stay, the rehab, all of that, a lot of room for improvement. And that, I think, is one of the main reasons why the minimally invasive um, kind of revolution kind of took hold, because we started seeing hey, our patients aren't staying in the hospital five to seven days with hemophag drains and, and braces and walkers and going to rehab after a one or two level fusion anymore. We can do better than that. Um, I mean, even Tony Soprano knows, right? And the more we cut you, the more you're going to hurt. So now patients are coming in. They're demanding less. They're asking for it, right? They're coming in saying, I want it less. I, I don't know how many times in clinic I see a patient who's been fully worked up and offered surgery, and they come in for the less invasive option. They're surgical, but they've been offered a front back or whatever, and they say, I don't want that hit. You know, can you do it less invasively? This is, this is no longer the future. This is today. The, the training programs are teaching the residents. So soon, next generation, it's going to be flooded with surgeons who can do it and who are offering it. And if you can't, you're going to be a dinosaur and you're going to go away. So, I mean, this, you have, this, like he said, this isn't minimally invasive surgery. This is spine surgery now. This is the way it is. Next generation, all this other stuff is going to be like the big open... Um, abdominal surgeries and the big open uh, orthopedic wax, you can't do it anymore. Um, so he said exactly out of my word, uh, you know, out of my mouth, we won't be calling it minimally invasive anymore. This is spine surgery. All right. For me, I think this really is the key, the inner space. They asked me to talk about the expandable cage, 
And I think one of the reasons why they might have is because they know that I've been a pro proponent about, for it forever. And we were in, um, in Boston in 2012 for the Striker Think Tank, and they were asking, what do you guys think is the future? What do you guys think is the most important from a company standpoint? What should we focus on? What should we develop? And, and I said, the inner space is the key. For all the cases that he showed, you release via the inner space. You fuse via the inner space. You're not going to get minimally invasive success unless you can conquer the inner space. So it's not just the spacer. That's one part of it. But it's also how do we get more disk out? How do we prepare the inner space better? How do we, dev how do we prepare the in plates for better fusion rates? And then the cages themselves are key. And I think the disk prep still sucks. Right? They've, they've, there's some systems that have come and gone with the hydrojet and the other whatever spine wave mechanical thing, but they all kind of suck. Uh, so I think there's whatever company improves on that makes it easier to get more disk out more efficiently and safe. They're going to win. Um, and then the biologics other than BMP, stem cells and all that, just not proven. They come and talk to me every day and they promise me everything about how this is the next best thing and fusion rates are through the roof and rats and rabbits or whatever else, but they haven't proven anything um, you know, clinically. I think that data will come, but as of now, we're, we're still kind of in the dark. Cages have improved significantly. Um, and I think expandable technology is, in my, my opinion, one of the biggest leaps um, that improved it. And let me just ask, who's using expandable cages now? A couple. Um, who doesn't? Huh? Is it going to pull? OK. Um, all right. I want to have a conversation as to why those. But these are the type. Oh. All right. All right, cool. That's kind of what I would have expected, right? Static peak is the standard. It's kind of what we've always used for in the recent times. Um, and then the expandable titanium. Well, expandable peak, I don't know of a good expandable peak except for the stacks. Is that what people are using? This, whoever said this? Expandable peak? Is that the stacks one, just the wafers? OK. Um, I just want to ask, those who are not using expandable, is there a reason? Is it financial? Is it not available? Do you not believe in the technology? Anybody? Yep. I kind of felt like, um, at least in the past, so the, the types of cage designs that I've seen, when you pack it with bone and then you expand it and you have an empty yep. space, right? Sure. So I was sort of like, oh, what do you do about that? So if there was a way where you could actually pack it with bone, expand it, and then pack it some more, yeah. you know, that's, that's what I would want. <coughs> And there are some that can post pack now. Um, anybody else? The way I use bone. Yeah. And bone. I, the room is preferred with the static cages. Okay. Certainly, if I can, if I get my static cages past the roof, if I can't, or if the disk material is far enough, I can't build a less room with bone. So you can expand both past it. You okay. Expand into the space. So your default is is the standard static. And you'll use the expandable for a difficult case to try if, OK. Anybody else? Yeah. I think it's the radio lucency. So I, I also agree with the whole close packing thing. I think Globus has one now that you can close pack, um, which is pretty slick. I, I, you know, the things that I've seen, I, I really like the fact that like a low doses that you're, you're able to obtain where you're not getting that, like the seven degree or five degree cages that are out there. The, the problem is, is the, the radio lucency with peak is is awful, right? especially in CAT scans. I mean, you can't see anything. Um, they're talking about osteo integration and how the osteo glands is stimulated with titanium, um, but it's not fusing to titanium. Uh, it's never going to fuse to titanium. It just can't. So, so you know, and, and then it comes to cost. And so, when you start adding these factors, one, I can't really tell from a radiographic standpoint what happens with an expandable metal cage. Whether that's the four web or this expandable titanium cages that are out there, and you know, I do believe the science as far as it being causing less chronic inflammation and causing more of a um, an osteoblastic response. It's just that if you can't see that it's fused, and granted, some people have said, well, it doesn't matter, especially in say laterals where you're spanning um, the ring apophysis, and if you have a stable. Super 
pseudo, you probably never, ever, ever know unless you get a CAT scan. And so to me, I don't think PEEP is all that bad. And, and people have been trashing it over the last five, six years. But I mean, yeah, you have to use BMP. And so if you're, if you're not an advocate of BMP, um, use autograph now. And, and the fusion rates are you know, 80 plus percent. So that's kind of the way that I look at it is if it isn't broke, why are we fixing it and then adding cost to the system? So if someone came to me and said, well, I can give it to you for $4,000 like we can with static peak, well, then that's one thing. But to me, it's a cost thing and it's an inability to radiographically confirm fusion in those cases, especially in a T-lift, because I think T-lift is where you can get subsidence regardless if you get a, uh, you know, it's not a lateral cage where you're spanning the rim. The chances of subsidence are pretty low. And it being stable, but with a with a T lip cage, I think it's it's much more difficult um, to get a stable fusion. And if it's not if it's a non union, then how do you confirm? Right. Everything you said is um, exactly what companies are thinking too when they're thinking about how do we either acquire or develop our next our our own expandable cage. How do we address all those issues? Some surgeons swear that it, I need radiolucency. I have to. See, I have to see the fusion. Um, so you know, there's always that battle between going straight titanium or having the, the the peak component. Others say I have to have a chamber. I have to have a, you know, a, a chamber within so I can pack. And and other surgeons say I don't care about that chamber. I'm going to pack around it anyway. Um, and then you know, other surgeons say I'm going to go up front and I don't want a banana cage and I'm going to get my lordosis that way and just pack behind it. Um, so it's difficult to try to figure out one cage that every surgeon is going to like. Um, but I think there's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Obviously, there are different kind of cages, and there are those that have similar foot plates to the static, and there are others that are smaller. Um, but you know, I've kind of debated with myself: Do I want a bigger foot plate versus not? I want a bigger one because I want more anterior column support. I mean, that's the reason you're putting it in there. But if it's peak, I kind of want a smaller one because wherever that peak is, that's it's not going to fuse there, right? It's kind of going against my goal of the surgery. Um, and so I've, you know, I've really gone towards good carpentry around that thing, around the cage, because that's the only place it's going to fuse. It's not going to fuse where the peak in plates are. And that little chamber in the middle, if you're going to rely on that, you're screwed, right? So you better go all the way around it and just get as much fusion around it as you can. And we'll, we'll get to it. But I think there's significant um, opportunities for improvement of the, of the materials. And you know, instead of a material like a peak, and I'm not anti-peak, but peak doesn't, it, it doesn't aid. Some people say it hinders. Um, but I don't. But we. I think we can all agree it doesn't aid in the fusion sure. process, um, and I think there's ways around it. We'll get to it here. So you know, since 2011, and, and that's when the Globus caliber cage came out. I've been using expandable cages exclusively for all my fusions, and I've had to deal with the administrators asking me, "Is it absolutely necessary for you to have to use these expandable cages on on every level?" And you guys seen Dodgeball, the movie Dodgeball? Yeah. Remember the. the the response when they ask the guy in the wheelchair, is it necessary that you throw wrenches at us? He says, necessary? Is it necessary that I drink my own urine? <laughs> no, but it's sterile, and I like the way it tastes. <laughs> I tell them, when I answer that to the administrators, the conversation's over. No. I say, no, it's, <laughs> it's not necessary, but I think it's better for my patient. And I give them the reasons. I can go in small, safer to go past the nerve roots. I can expand. It's perfect size every time. 
Um, I can lift the patient off the table with it. It's always engaged into the end plates, especially at 5.1 with the fish mouth. I'm not trying to bang in a big cage to a tiny posterior, and then up, when it's up front, it's just floating around. And, you know, it's, it's better. My job is to do what I think is best for my patient. Your job is to try to get it for the cheapest price possible. Do your job, you know? And so they usually, like, get out of here. You do whatever you want. Um, what's that? Go drink your urine. Exactly. Go drink your urine. <laughs> Um, okay, so when I first started, the first thing I noticed, it was easy, right? No more trials, no more trying to figure out what exactly what size I needed to use. Eh, I think I need 11. Can I get a 12 in? Nah, I don't know. I don't want to bang it too much. Let me give, it, give me 11, right? There, it, that just went away. It was always a perfect size. 5.1, um, I think, is key, right? 5.1 is the fish mouth, and I always undersized. Maybe it was just me, but I always undersized my, my static cage because it was always super tight in the back. And by the time I got past that posterior rim, it was like, oh, shit, this thing is floating around. I hope I never see this cage again. You know? Um, and now I don't have that issue, obviously. Um, what else? With the, yeah, you want to say something? No? With the, um, let's see. Yeah, the, the indirect canal decompression. So um, it's kind of like the lateral, right, where they say, yeah, oh, you don't have to go and decompress all these central stenoses. Just jack up the, in, the, the inner space and you'll get ligamentaxis and it'll, it'll decompress them. And there's, there's truth to that for sure. It's been proven. Um, Framingly for sure that happens. Um, and so if you have a powerful enough cage that won't bust into the end plates, you can accomplish that, right? And I think there's, there, there's some room there for improvement compared to the, the cage that, you know, the globus cage. I don't think it's powerful enough to do that, but I think Aculif, one we're going to talk about, is powerful enough to do that. Um, what else? All right, so here's some of the comp competitors. The wafers, the, spi the spine wave stacks. I think that was one of the first ones. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, no chamber at all. Um, some surgeons didn't like that. They didn't like to just, uh, you know, put a hunk of plastic in there um, with, with no chamber. Um, the spinology optimist, that's the bone of the bag. Some guys are still using that. Anybody still using that? So it's just like a, it's a hacky sack. You smash some DBMs through it. It's kind of like a pseudoarthrosis machine. No? Right. What, what's that? Yeah. I've taken one out of the abdomen. That was that one. So, <laughs> um, I spawn optic cage. That's actually a good one. Um, but it's the, the, um, the, what he, what he mentioned about the foot plate is exactly accurate about this eye spine. It, it's it's um, kind of big when you put it in, and then as it expands, it shrinks. The foot plate shrinks, and they, they don't have good enough um, variability in, 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 in the sizes. The globus one is the caliber one. I think that's the one that really, at least where I am, that's the one that took this, made this, go, you know, this technology take off. Successful, billions of dollars of profit, um, Depuy Synthes didn't have one, Medtronic didn't have one, Stryker didn't have one, and they saw the, the profit that Globus was making, and they saw the cases lost. Uh, people, when people who started believing in this technology, they started moving towards Globus because they had the only one, the best one. Um, and, and that's when, in, at least in my territory, Medtronic's like, we gotta do something. And so Medtronic bought that, this Chinese company, AMT Spine, for their wave cage, um, and Stryker bought Coline for the Aculif, the Pew Synthes still doesn't have anything. I think they're still trying to make one themselves. Um, let's see. So this is an ex extremely dynamic area. Uh, you know, it, surgeons are going to demand this more and more, especially as minimally invasive becomes more and more popular, and people are trying to do things through smaller ports. If you're going to try to go, f like, like Jeff said, you're going to try to go from open to tubular to endoscopic to whatever, uh, you can't keep using your big hunk of your big static hunk, you know, hunks of metal and hunks of bone and hunks of plastic. You're going to have to figure out a way to put something small through a small port and then get it to the size you need. So this is the future. It's going to happen. Um, so surgeons are going to demand it. Um, and I, I do think soon the future of this is going to be outpatient endoscopic T-lifts is going to be the, the next step. And then after that, some laser science fiction stuff. Um, all right. Okay, so from the inner body material standpoint, peak is the most common. The pendulum has swung, right? We went from bone to metal to plastic, and now it's starting to swing back a little bit away from plastic, away from peak, 
people are re-looking re at metals again, uh, and they're looking at, okay, how about we, can we have the best of both worlds? Can we have the radiolucency of peak and the modulus of elasticity of peak, um, but try to get some integration of the in plates? And so they're spraying it with a bunch of things, either titanium or, or what is it, plasma. Um, the trabecular metal, I think, has a, f a future here. It's really cool stuff. It, it almost looks like um, one of those scrub things you use in the sink, the little, you know what I'm saying? Brill pad. It's, like, it's a brill pad. It's just very porous metal that is strong enough to support the anterior column, but it's very porous, um, and it integrates, and you can put bone and everything through it, too. The silicon nitride is really cool. Amedica is a small company, I think, out of Utah. Um, it looks like a carbon fiber. It looks like a Depew static black carbon fiber cage. But there's no um, artifact on imaging. Um, and it supposedly integrates like a metal. Um, so I, I keep an eye out for that. I think that's going to be something that we're going to hear more about. Yep. So there, there's actually a, uh, a peak product. I guess you can put it on anything. There's a, a technology. It's, uh, it's a NASA. Talk about lasers. It is a laser that uh, they're etching peak. Right. Using uh, the same uh, configuration as isotropic well bone, so it doesn't have to remodel. And they're putting it on peak, and they're showing a significant, uh, almost uh, titanium-like integration in which it's, you know, you're you're at the micron nano level where the osteocytes and osteoblasts integrate. And again, it's not fusing; nothing's going to fuse, but. You know, if you look at it from, it's like putting on a combat team right. and lacing it up. That's kind of what most of the peak and this laser etching, on, uh, I'm sorry, it's titanium and this laser etch peak is the same yeah. thing. So you're getting the radiolucency, but it has that uh, that surface that's etched on with this right. laser. It's, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Right. Um, I mean, it's, we've been doing this forever with ACDs, right? It's not fusing through our graft. Right. It's spot welding at the in plates and the interface on both sides. And if you get spot welding on both sides, then you're stable, right? And that's all we need in the lumbar spine. Why do we need to fuse all the way across that sure. gap? We really don't. As long as that spacer is participating in that process and not hindering that the integration, you know, that's it's gonna be a better it's gonna be a better spacer. Um, okay. So and you know I the globus cage is a good one. I'm not here to sell it. It's a good one, but it's not perfect. And there for sure is in, um, areas of improvement. I told David Paul, the owner of globus, <laughs> I said, listen, your cage is good, but it's inside out. It's inside out. You got the metal on the inside and you got the plastic on the outside. I said, I'd rather have the metal on the in plates and the pl radiolucency in the middle and get your engineers to work. You know, he's like, it's easier said than done, but somebody's going to figure it out where they can get the in plates to, to fuse and they can still see through it. Um, okay, so range of expandability. That's obviously key, right? You want it to start as small as possible and you want it to go up as high as you need every time. Um, power. Um, power is a balance, right? It can be super strong and bust right through the bones and you're screwed, or it can be just super weak and it's not gonna really get you anything from, an ex from a um, decompression standpoint or from a in-plate um, uh, uh, adhesion standpoint. Um, steerability. Who uses oblique, oblique versus banana? Just straight down or, or banana? Who tries to steer it in? Anybody? Anybody? Bullets straight through? Most people? Yeah? yeah. Me too. And that's just because it's easy and fast and there's really a, no clinical difference. But there's, I think, theoretical advantages to the, to the banana. Right, if you can steer it up and get it up on the front and jack up, you can really use the power and really elevate and really get lower doses because you're on the apophyseal ring. You're not gonna bust through the weak center part of the bone as much. And then you can pack the hell out of that whole disc space behind it, right? So theoretically, it'd be great to be able to do that if you could do it easy. Right now, there's so much fiddle factor um, that most guys just like, I'm just gonna shoot it right in there and, and usually it's okay. Um, chamber size, important for some guys, not important for others. I think it's important if you've got a material that doesn't incorporate, you, you'd like to have some kind of incorporation around it, through that cage. If you've got a, a material that does incorporate, I don't think you need a chamber, right? You're gonna rely more on the foot plate itself. Um, the lordotic versus parallel expansion. Um, anything above 
a three, four, obviously, but four, five up, parallel, I think, is good enough. Five, one, um, I think you need Lordotic, or you need the banana, right? If you're not going to go Lordotic, you need to get up front, shoot it in small, steer it up front, and then you can jack up parallel up in the front. But if you're going to shoot across, then you're going to be both in the anterior part of the disc space and the posterior part of the disc space. Anatomically, those disc spaces are not parallel. And so you go in there and you jack a parallel cage up into a non-parallel space, you're going to do one of two things. You're either going to make them parallel, which is going to give them sagittal, you know, positive sagittal balance, and you're going to lose lordosis, or you're just going to be floating around. You're not going to be incorporated in the in plates. Okay, so the, the, the aculif, what I like about it, um, it's a cool design, it's extremely powerful, it's titanium, it's a plus minus for some people, um, but it, I don't know if you guys know the design of it, it's got these staircases on the inside, two wheels, two stairs on each side, and it really locks like six times per millimeter, so it's extremely strong, and it, um, can it, it once it's locked it gives you this monolithic strong anterior column support um, now people always worry about uh, I don't know about the tactile feedback I want to feel that thing I want to feel it expand and engage you really do get some of that feedback with that hydraulic um, the hydraulic lifting the steerable again I don't think it makes a difference clinically but um, I think for people to say that I can take a flat back or a positively sagittally balanced kyphotic patient and get them back to normal with T-lift inner body cages, I think right now that's probably difficult. But if we've got an easy way to go up front, like I said, and really elevate the anterior column at multiple levels, I think we could do that. And I think this is going to be, I know some guys are doing it. Um, Sig Bourbon in, in San Francisco and those guys, they're doing it with this cage and it's, it's, it's a very powerful cage. I, I don't think I could do that with the, the other cages, the peak cages that I'm using. Big graft window, and this is, this is the smallest starting height of all the ones that I know of. It starts at six and it can jack up to 16. I mean, that's pretty impressive. All right, so the material again, talked about it. The range, the power of all of these things, I think they're better than the other co the co competition. Steerability, there's other cages that you can steer, but the chamber, well, the chamber size also. But from the power and the range of expansion, I don't think you can beat it. Um, quick case, real quick. 39 years old, I, the reason I put this up is I just saw her two days ago for her one-year post-op. 39 years old, two years of bad back pain, right greater than left leg, L5. She kind of had a trans transitional segment, and it was a lumbarized S1, so they were calling it L5, L6. All conservative measures. She had an injection, helped transit in the past, but no more. She's miserable, and she's saying, do something. Do something now. Um, this is her MRI. So that's um, one on the left is central. One on the left, is, and the one on the right is foraminal. Right, and so you can see, let's see. You can see the foram bad foraminal stenosis. You can see the L5 root getting smashed there. The CT, she had PARS defects on both sides. And she was bone on bone, and that frame was just crushed. How would you guys treat it? Is that the, Sarah? Is that the next thing? Should I hit it? Oh, okay. I give you a lot of options here. There's a lot of options, and there's not a right one or a wrong one. All right, so MIST lift and lateral with perk screws and then a lift front back. I mean, they're all great, right? No pros and cons of each one. In your hands, you gotta do what you're most comfortable with. Um, the lateral, I'd be a little worried just because transitional segment, it looks like a four five, it may actually be a five one, you just gotta see where that crest is. Um, 
you know, and, and from the neural anatomy standpoint too, maybe a little different than you think. If the vertebral segments are congenitally abnormal because of a transitional segment, those nerve roots may be a little bit more anterior than you expect at that level, right? You, you, may, you may think it may be acting like a 4-5, but it could be acting like a 5-1, and it could be really kind of anterior. Um, front back is a good procedure for this, but it's a front back. Um, if you do the MIS uh, screws, then you, you, know, you really take away some of that hit from the open front back. Open posterior lateral is not wrong. Um, if you don't do an inner body there, I would just worry that you're not going to get that frame and decompress. Right? It really isn't a foramenal disc. It's not a, um, it, it really is a collapse of disc space and a loss of foramenal height problem. Right? So you can get in there and you can take down that whole joint and you can unroof that root. You're going to you know, you're gonna unroof it. You're going to take the pressure off the back of it. Pressure on the back of it's not the problem. It's the north-south diameter of the frame and that's the problem. So if you don't get into that inner body and really jack it up and open that frame in how it, to how it used to be, she may still have a problem. Right? Does that make sense? So personally, I think this is a perfect case for an inner body, whether it's anterior or lateral or T-lift. I think you got to get in there and you got to try to jack that up. Um, now there, there, there'll be guys who say, ah, we do this. We used to do this all the time, posterior laterally and open. They did fine. Yeah, usually they'll do fine. But I think if you can get that foramenal height up and lock it in an open position, I think you've really done everything you can from a decompression stabilization standpoint. Anybody have anything? Yeah. Absolutely. So, so you would lean towards what? A lift. Right. I mean, that's a huge point. And so, you guys shouldn't think that this, these, these um, cages are the are, are a car jack. You know, you're not going to get in this small space and then put this thing in there and expect this thing to do the work. It's not. It's going to bust through the implates or it's going to torque out, right? You got to do your carpentry and your work before you put this cage in. You got to loosen things up with your paddles and you got to do all the normal work that you do before you put a static cage in. You got to do the same thing. You got to jack that, loosen that up. Uh, and then what you want to try to do with the expandable cage is maintain what you've just done, right? If you get a few more millimeters through the expansion of this thing, great, but you're not going to rely on this thing to really do all that work, right? Because you will, you will bust through. Um, does that make sense? All right, let's see. So I just did minimally invasive with the Aculif cage. I mean, you can see we, we went from bone on bone to a little bit up. With, because it was a T-lift, I, I had a direct nerve root decompression. I saw that root. I saw that root smashed before I got to the inner space separated, and I saw that root wide open after I got the um, inner space separated. And then you just lock it in open position. I just saw her Tuesday, I think. Super happy. I mean, any way you would have done this, if you had just gotten that pressure off that root and stabilizer, she would have been fine. Yeah. What's your look on uh, post op MRI and CT? How do you assess fusion? Right. Um, so the globus cage that is a hybrid peak metal, there really isn't much artifact on the MRI, especially at the adjacent segments, right? Sometimes you put these things in there and it blossoms and you can't see the adjacent segments, um, but that's not the case here. And actually with this, I haven't had an issue with adjacent segments. There is a little bit more blossoming at the index segment, you know, at this segment because it's, it's, it's metal, but it's not steel. It's not stainless steel, it's titanium. So the, the, the artifact isn't horrible. CAT scan is perfect. CAT scan, you can see everything. You can see whether it's healed, you can see whether it's not. You're not getting much beam hardening artifact from, from on a CT. Uh, it's titanium. It's like, a new, it's like a hip. You know, it's like the screws and the rods, right? And when you get a CAT scan with the screws and the rods, you can see the bone perfectly around those screws. You can see whether there's haloing around those screws or not, right? And it's kind of similar here. You can kind of see the, the uh, inner body growth around it or not. I personally would go posterior just because the the pars defects on both sides, 
you can make an argument to do a standalone ALIF and just pray that they heal before they break down, right? But I mean, it's like if, if you're driving in your car, would you want to drive without a spare tire or not, right? You'll probably be okay, but if you get a flat, you're screwed. You know, so you know you'll probably be you might be okay with a standalone, but if she doesn't heal, you're gonna be saying, oh, "I wish I kind of had that belt and suspenders and locked her down." And that, if it were anybody who's bonded like this, deformed like this, where you actually put energy in to jack up and reduce back, that same energy is gonna be going against whatever construct you put in, right? And so if you just put a standalone a lift with these little screws or a plate or whatever it is, all the forces are gonna be trying to go back to this. Right? They're all going to try to go back to forward. So that's a lot of stress. So in my mind, just locking it down. Yeah, you're like, would you do a standalone? A standalone A-lift? Yeah, people do it, and they get away with it. The one time you don't get away with it. What's it? Yeah, no, I mean, she's 39 and her spine looks like that, right? She's, she'll be back for other problems. Yeah. I agree. I have the Seaxial and I voted for a lateral because it's like grade two. Yeah. It's really going to lapse posteriorly. Right. So it's going to be really hard to get in there. Yeah. Even with an expansion. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, my concern with doing T lifts and having to be aggressive to try to loosen up the disc space is that they violate. Yeah. It's always a concern, absolutely. So, do you, what are your techniques? Do you have little tips and tricks you're doing? Like, are you putting screws in on the other side and uh, decompressing yeah. it, locking it to try to open the space, or what kind of stuff are you doing? Like, you just had to right. Kind of so, the contralateral screw rod is a backup for me. I haven't had to do that in a long time. But those who are really stiff and really rigid, and I get in there with my paddles and it's not moving, then I'll do that. I'll go down and I'll put the tube down, I'll take down the other joint. Her case, she had bilateral pars defects and she was kind of, she was mobile in the back. Um, but if they're not, you can take down the other joint, you can put your contralateral screws and a, a rod that's a bit longer, right? And now you got both joints kind of down um, and then you can get on your ipsilateral side with paddles and you can start with the smallest, a seven or eight, turn it, lock your superior screw, set screw, take that paddle out, put in the next level, loosen your set screw, turn, lock, and you can just do that sequentially. And then that way you're maintaining whatever distraction you get with the other side. And then you can do your inner body stuff, your cage and then your ipsilateral. I haven't had to do that in a long time, but sometimes when they're really stiff, you kind of have to. Um, but I found that most of the time they get up enough to just, and again, you don't need to jack her up to a 12 or 13 disc space. You just need to get this pressure off that root and you just need to get that frame and height up. So I've been able to do that usually. Yeah. I'll start with the blunts. I'll just start with the blunts. And if it's really easy, like somebody who has a big disc, if I was doing this level, I'd probably just start with the cutting right away. I wouldn't even start with the blunts. I'd just start with the cutting because there's plenty of space. When they're collapsed like this, even though she's got the modic changes and it looks strong, I'll just start with the blunts and just get an idea, okay, how mobile is this thing before I start cutting into the end plate. If it's really mobile, I'll just do a couple blunts and then I'll go straight to sh shaving. If it's not mobile, then I'll take my time with the blunts and really try to loosen things. Anything else? I think that's it. <laughs>